This is the tank that got hit with 14 RPG rockets and an ATG missile. Yes, that's right, and in one incident around 70 RPGs were launched against it and survived. Well, it's all because of this top secret Dorchester or Chobham armor built with possibly multiple space layers of steel and plastic. We will also be looking at the fire and control system of this tank. Using the stationary joystick to track and fire with this trigger, hidden just below the controls. Interestingly, this tank requires three parts of ammunition loading process. To fire this rifle gun, and most importantly, the basic process of driving this tank. All in the videos ahead, so don't miss a beat. This Challenger 2 is the United Kingdom's most advanced main battle tank made, but it came a long way from the British Mark IV, the first battle-tested tank made by British engineers during the First World War. Let's start with the specs and features of this tank before we move into the interiors. This tank commands a length of 8.3 meters or 27 feet 3 inches, while the length with the gun forward is around 13.5 meters or 44 feet 3 inches. The width of this tank is around 3.5 meters or 11 feet 6 inches. If we consider, the width along with the reactive armor is around 4.2 meters or 13.9 feet. While the height of this tank is around 2.95 meters or 9.7 feet. It has a combat weight of 68.8 US tons or 62.5 tons in metric measurements, making it one of the heaviest tanks in the world, similar to the Leopard 2 and the Ibrams and the Israeli Merkava at 71 US tons. While the Russian T-90 weighs 50 US tons and the Ukrainian T-72 weighs around 45 US tons. Let's now compare this to an average human to understand its size, even better comparing it with the other main battle tanks. The Leopard 2, the Abrams, the Merkava, the Arjun tank, the T-90, and the Ukrainian T-72B. We can see Soviet-era strategy was to have low-profile tanks. The reason was to avoid being hit when dug in the trenches, but that strategy becomes obsolete in today's battle scenario during the era of drones and top attack missiles. Let's start from the front. This is the 120mm rifled gun, which is one of the only guns used by NATO. This is the muzzle reference system, and moving to the back is the fume extractor. So, let's see how this works. When fired the shell passes through it, then an opening into the bore takes in the gases, containing them until the shell has exited. The bore acts as a pressure vacuum that helps in evacuating the harmful gas pushing it outwards. Let's move to the top of the tank. This is the commander's primary sight that has a 360 degree field of view. These are the commander's unity vision periscopes in case the commander's primary sight is damaged. Just below it is the gunner's primary sight. This square looking object is the thermal observation and gunnery sight on top of the rifle gun. Just beside it is the gunner auxiliary sight. At the front of the loader hatch is mounted a remote weapon station enforcer, which can be armed with this 7.62mm NATO machine gun, or in some rare cases, this grenade launcher. This weapon station is fitted with a thermal vision capability and can be operated and fired from the commander position. These are the smoke grenade discharge, or they could also be upgraded like the Challenger 2 Black Knight, which was a prototype fitted with this Iron Fist APS system's radar and hard kill countermeasure. The active protection system and radar could also be attached to the back of the tank, giving it almost 360 degree of protection. Let's see how this works. Step number one. Enemy fires anti-tank rocket. Step number two. The sensor suite radar automatically detects and identifies multi-threat scenarios and with accurate counter-attack capabilities against the launching source. Step number three. It intercepts the threat by launching a small warhead and initiating it at a safe distance from the protected platform at a precisely calculated moment and defeating or destructing the threat through a shockwave effect. Again, this iron fist might not work against tank shells, so the British engineers fitted the tank with this explosive reactive armor similar to Abrams tanks animated in our recent video. To increase protection, a protective steel plate is attached to the reactive armor boxes. It is made of a flyer plate, an explosive charge, and an armor base plate. 
When an incoming shell or rocket hits the steel plate, it slows down and hits the flyer plate, activating the explosive charge and armor blocks with less kinetic energy. They then detonate pushing the projectiles outwards, helping prevent the deadly shells from penetrating into the vehicle, thereby protecting the crews. And if all the three layers of protections fails. The Brits have the battle-tested Chopham armor as the last line of defense. Let's remove all the reactive armor to explain this incident of a British Challenger 2 tank being hit by 14 RPGs and a Milan anti-tank guided missile. The tank was under attack by irregular forces armed with machine guns and RPGs when it damaged the counter-surveillance system. While attempting to back away from the attack, it ultimately threw its tracks and entered a ditch. Despite being hit by 14 RPGs and an ATG missile, the crew survived the attack and remained safe within the tank until it was recovered for repairs. The worst damage was to the sighting system, but the tank was back in operation six hours later. In one instance, a Challenger 2 tank survived a total of 70 RPG hits during a certain war without suffering a catastrophic failure. This shows the toughness of the Chobham armor. So, Let's see how this works. Chabam armor, or some called this the Dorchester armor. It works because of its composition and space arrangements. It is made up of a combination of steel plastic or ceramic and steel spaced at different angles as shown in this animation. When an RPG hits the tank, it has to go through this amount of layers and composition of steel and plastic to penetrate the turret, slowing the projectiles and then rendering it obsolete. Let's go inside the tank. This is the commander section. Just beside his seat is the commander's control panel. Moving forward, this is the fire control panel, or FCP. This small round object is the commander display unit. Just besides it is the commander's primary site. The commander can search for at least four or more targets. He uses this fixed video game like joystick to find and track the target and sends data to the gunner. It works like this, even when the gun is in the opposite direction, the whole turret automatically turns it to the designated hostile target. Moving down we have the gunner section, just beside him is gunner's control panel. This red looking switch is the fire control switch for gun safety override. When he wants to fire the gun, he turns the switch from safe to live and the red light blinks. This is the gunner's day sight or thermal imagers. Pressing the left thumb turns the screen from day to thermal imager, as shown in the animation. This mag refers to magnification, or in some words, zoom in or out to find the targets. Laze means the laser range finder. Using the middle thumb button, he can also switch from coaxial, 7.62mm chain gun, located at the front of the turret. Switching the controls to the right activates the main 120mm rifle gun. This is the add or drop line switch, which is used for hatch rounds corrections suitable for static targets. And the last and most important one is the trigger clip, located below the joystick, to fire the gun. Let's simplify it more. Step 1. When the commander finds a target, he lays the target for the gunner, which turns the gun towards the target. Step 2. He corrects the wind and elevation through the gunner's primary sights for the target, just like the animation here. Step 3. He turns the switch from off to main. Step 4. He presses this firing switch and boom, opens fire this 120mm rifle gun. Step 5. If the gunner wants to fire the coaxial machine gun, he switches from main to coax. He then aims and presses the trigger below the control sticks when ready. If all the electrical powers, gunners, and commander primary sights are destroyed, the tank main gun could still be operated manually. The gunner cranks the handle, just like the World War II tanks. Doing this results in the moving of the turret up and down. He then searches the targets through this auxiliary sight here and fires the gun when ready. This is the loader section. Interestingly, the Challenger has three parts of the ammunition process. A high explosive squash head, or in short, it's called the hash round. A charge propelling is a cloth bag, D-shaped in cross-section, filled with a bundle of propellant sticks. 
This is a tube vent electric magazine with 10 rounds. The TVE is used to ignite the main propelling cloth bag. This is how it works. Step 1. Gunner puts the hash round first. Step 2. The loader then slides the propellant bag with all the sticks in it. Step 3. The loader then slides this magazine containing 10 blank bullets. All set and done the gunner then pulls the trigger to fire the gun. These rounds have a range of 8 kilometers or 4.9 miles. To fire the Sebo round, the gunner first puts the discarding Sebo and then slides the charge round. This also requires a blank round to ignite the propellant charge. Interestingly, the Challenger 2 does not have any blow-off panel like the Abrams tanks as animated in our recent video. But it is stored in this ready charge bin, which insulates the tank in case it is penetrated by an enemy projectile. That is the reason these Seborons are kept open all over the tanks as shown here. Because these Sebo are non-explosive and requires the propellant charge along with the blank bullet to complete the whole round. The Challenger 2 is powered by a Perkins CV-12 diesel engine that produces 1200 horsepower at 2300 RPM. This engine is mated to a fully automatic transmission that features six forward and two reverse gears. Drive is transmitted from the engine through a splined coupling close coupled to the engine. The transmission transmits drive to these drive axles that are connected to the sprockets on each side of the tank. The maximum speed that this tank can reach is 37 miles per hour on road and 25 miles per hour off road. It has an internal fuel capacity of 421 gallons or 1,592 liters that provides a maximum operational range of 280 miles on road and 156 miles cross country. With an additional external fuel drum, it could cover a range of 341 miles. These are the cooling fans along with radiators that help maintain working temperature of the engine and also cools the engine bay. The tank is fitted with an auxiliary power unit that has a 600 ampere electrical output, which can be used to power the tank's electrical systems when it is stationary and the main engine is cut off. This helps minimize the consumption of fuel and lowers the audio and thermal signature of the tank. Let us look at the driver section of this tank. The driver enters from this hatch. This is the driver's seat. And this is the driver's periscope. This is what he sees when driving. Here are all the controls that the driver will operate while driving. For now, we will only analyze how the tank is driven. These are the steering tillers that are used to maneuver the tank. Beside it is the gear selector. Moving ahead is the accelerator and the brake which are similar to a car. In order to move the tank, the driver uses the accelerator pedal. To stop or slow down the tank, the driver uses the brake pedal. Now comes the interesting part, the levers or steering tillers. Using these will turn the tank left or right. To turn the tank to the left, the driver pulls up the left tiller. This disengages the clutch on the left track, causing it to slow down, while the right track is moving at a constant speed. This change in the track's speed causes the tank to turn left. The same thing applies when turning the tank to the right, the driver pulls up the right tiller. This disengages the clutch on the right track, causing the track to slow down while the left track maintains a constant speed, thus turning the tank to the right. In short, pull the left tiller to turn left. To turn right, pull the right tiller. Now you know how to drive the Challenger tank. Let's look at the pros and cons of this tank. It has an NBC protection system to shield the crew from chemical and biological attacks. The tank's advanced explosive reactive armor and chopping composites provide excellent protection against enemy fire. Even after being hit with 70 RPG rockets, the tank was not disabled. The Challenger 2 has a powerful engine that can reach speeds of up to 59 kilometers per hour or 37 miles per hour and good off-road capabilities, making it well-suited for various types of terrain. If all electrical component fails, the tank weapons could still be operated manually. These are the cons.
The Challenger 2 is an expensive tank at around $5 to $8 million if all the protection systems are added. It is also a heavy tank, which can make transportation and logistics more difficult compared to lighter tanks. This makes the tank more vulnerable in close combat urban areas, limiting its mobility to move around narrow roads. We create original 3D animation from scratch, so stay tuned as we examine the engineering behind the T90M autoloader and fire control system. So do us a solid and please like and subscribe to help us produce even better detailed 3D animations.